Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Welcome to another chapter of Turn the Page podcast, Syosset Public Library's podcast. And I am your librarian host, Stacey, and I'm here to interview our author guest, who is... Inisha Smith. And we're very excited to have you here. We're here to talk about your latest book. I have um, the advanced reader's copy with me, The Prince. And if you want to tell us a little bit about your book. Sure. My book, the novel, The Prince, is the story of a very wealthy family, which is which has terrible secrets. And the book is about how that family deals with these secrets. It's an, a contemporary retelling of a very great um, classical novel, The Golden Bowl by Henry James, which is written in what would what some would call very difficult language. It is difficult. And my novel is set in the 21st century and it's written in very ordinary English. And uh, you know, simple sentences, but um, so that's the basic premise of the novel. What is it? How does this family solve this terrible secret as it become begins to come to light? So that would be a sort of summary of the issue involved in the novel. So it's a good, sweet summary. So I I read um, a, a good portion of it. I wasn't able to finish it before our interview, but I really like it and. I never had heard of the Golden Bowl before. I really only know Henry James because of Turn of the Screw. Yes. And yes. Um, would like, I, I want to say one of his more popular ones that has been adapted a lot recently. Yes. Yes. It seems, but as soon as I was just like, oh, like I need to look more into the original, but I, I love the way you did it. It is like easy to understand sentences. Like it's a, yes. it's a quick read. I do have to say that you just get sucked in and you're like, what's happening? Oh no. Like, and even though it takes place like in modern times, 21st century, I could kind of see how it could take place even earlier. Right. And I, I, I enjoyed it. And so did a lot of other people. I, I saw a lot of the blurbs that other authors gave and you got praise from uh Kirkus reviews but I love that um, one of the blurbs that I looked up again is that um, Stephen King wrote a blurb for it. That was for one of my novels. Oh, um, that was for an earlier one? Yes, but it was I, for my third oh, novel. But I yeah, love it. I was just like, oh. But I, I see um, that a lot of people have high praise on the Amazon reviews and Goodreads reviews. It's getting a lot of stars. Thank you. So that's very exciting. So what made you want to redo or adapt this into a modern retelling? A good question. First of all, I want to go back to what you're saying about Henry James. You are not the only person who hasn't read The Golden Bowl, which mm -hmm. is his penultimate novel. It's, it really is difficult. To me, it's rewarding, but it's not necessarily going to be rewarding for everyone. I, I love Henry James. He takes me into another world. In this case, the um, world of the turn of the 20th century wealth, grand estates, you know, beautiful gardens. Mm -hmm. um, his novels are often about secrets and he writes in such a way as he grew older to the, the very style conceals the secret and allows the secret to push up. So I'm drawn to him because his language is extraordinary and I don't demand that it make complete sense on first reading. But I'm not going to tell, urge your readers to go to that novel because of my novel. Mm -hmm. I stole his idea, <laughs> I acknowledged it, and I hoped that I wouldn't be compared to him because he is one of the greatest novelists. But I wanted to, to think about what would happen if this story was brought into the 21st century, what would, we, how would it work out? What would the nature of this wealth be? So the family that I imagine are the descendants of the original family. They're the money, like so many American fortunes is, is based on, well, what we call the robber baron, um, John D. Rockefeller, the Vanderbilts, um, 
they, the Fricks, the Carnegies, they, those guys were brutes. They were horrible to their workers. And they, they then had Rockefeller, they had these huge fortunes which went down through the centuries. And how did the people who inherited this money, knowing what their predecessors were like, how did they deal with this? What do they, do they feel guilty? So what you see, for example, in real terms, in the Rockefeller family, you see a lot of the descendants are environmentalists, they're doctors, they do good. And I was interested in, in what happens, yet they still remain immensely wealthy. Mm -hmm. So I wondered, you know, how is that gonna work? So my guy, my hero, or my main one, the patriarch of the family, but the money is in the air he breathes. So what you've got, in the 21st century is the it's very secretive family um he has a daughter he's a widower he has a beautiful sweet sweet daughter who, who is very innocent because she has been protected by this wealth so along comes an impoverished italian prince so i began to think well, what what about impoverished italian royalty what's going on there so i found <laughs> an italian prince who really did or does still run a food cart in the way selling pizza. So, you know, in other words, <laughs> they're not all rich. And yeah. what happened was interesting to me um, because the Italian government does not recognize titles. Secondly, they, be, they taxed these, these royalty. There are more, you know, many of them very highly. Their, their great palazzos and estates were so highly taxed that it was very difficult for them to continue to to keep them some of them um rent it rent out to this day they rent it out or they rent out rooms in the palazzo or they conduct tours to to maintain them because on top of the problem is there are many many um legal prohibitions against renovating them, turning them into apartment complexes so for this reason not all these guys are rich so this man, this young prince, this Roman prince, he has a job with an Italian bank in New York where he doesn't make a lot of money. He's just a decoration. He is, yeah, you know, this is the prince Federico, you know, de Pavalia Cianlu. You know, he's here to advise you in, and to invest in Italian industries. And so he, you know, he's a, he's, kind of a lost soul in a way. He's 30, he doesn't really know who he is. He wanted to have a, 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 a hip hop band in Rome, mm -hmm. you know, not a bad figure. He volunteers in Rome with a, um, a group of migrant children who, um, you know, as a soccer coach, he wants to do something. These kids, you know, there are a lot of migrants in Rome. They come across the Mediterranean, they're, live in appalling conditions and the Romans basically hate them. So mm. this guy, you know, he has a good heart, but he's looking for himself and he has a mother he wants to support because she's aging. She lives in the old grand apartment, which is now sort of disintegrating. He comes to America and he meets this sweet girl who's very, very rich. And he thinks he's in love with her and, and she is very good and kind. And they get married, but in, in other words, he's gaining the, the money he needs. It's not cold hearted, but it, he's getting it. And she, or her family is gaining cachet of royalty, which happened a lot at the turn of the uh, 20th century. The Vanderbilts, a lot of these people married into European royalty for the same reasons, only in perhaps a cold hearted way. Anyway, in this marriage, that it takes place. Um, the rich family, the Woodfords, have a beautiful private island which resembles Long uh, Gardner's Island a bit, where I've been. But nobody else is allowed to go in. But I was there a couple times just as a guest. <laughs> so, the long comes the prince's old girlfriend, who was <laughs> right an American American Italian girl, um, who was also a childhood friend of his bride, and unbeknownst to his bride, the two had this very passionate affair 
They couldn't get married because neither had any money. Now she's back. And what's going to happen? Well, the prince can't help himself. He, he actually loves this other woman too. They begin their affair. It's hidden from his wife and his father-in-law. But it soon becomes, there's soon a suspicion that something is happening. And you never, in the James novel, it's never declared, which is one of the geniuses of that novel. And in my novel, it's not declared immediately. It's not as if someone yells, oh, you're having an affair with my, with my son-in-law or whatever. <laughs> I guess that's what he is, um, you know, the patriarch. So, but my novel is about the growing sense that something bad is happening. Um, or, but it's not, she's not sure the bride, we are not, never quite sure what the patriarch knows. And then, so how do you solve this problem? I should add that the prince and the heiress have a baby, which is kind of important to this plot. <laughs> it's great to hear you talk because as I'm reading it, and you brought up about like how of like renting tours for the palazzos. Yeah. I'm just thinking about because I'm a big fan of um I love watching like the like period dramas of stuff. Yeah. So it makes yeah. me think of like with um Downton Abbey of like they started yeah. opening up um the land to have people come and like yeah. I mean that was back in the day, but even more recently, like not just Italian um wealthy people, but there's and, and this is like going into like a whole other thing of um years ago for a friend's birthday like there's a scottish castle that they literally sell like a square footage of land That's to help right. keep renovate and historically like accurate yes. of this castle and i i bought her one as a gift and bought myself one so i have like a little certificate a of like, of land. Oh, yeah That's interesting. <laughs> But I get to, you know, yeah. help pay for renovations and everything. So it made me kind of wonder like, oh, like, you know, it, it could tie in because your writing does have like, I could see it. Like you talk about modern things of like going to get iced coffee and cell phones right. and skyscrapers yeah. and just, I, so I could picture, you know, happening outside in the world today, yeah. but I also feel like I'm reading a historical thing because it just the way you're writing has an aspect to me of like, Oh, it can happen in this time and in this. It's it's kind of goes across time, if that makes sense. Well, that, that's very. I'm very honored that you say that because, it, in a funny way, I wanted to tell this story right of these secrets and this family because mm -hmm. I think all families have a secret. You know, there's oh crazy, yeah, crazy Uncle Joe. You know, <laughs> must read and we don't see him, and there's somebody had an affair or something, and so. Okay, but how to bring it up into the present? This was a challenge intellectually. I had to make it believable. Therefore, I had to believe it. But what you're saying in Great Britain, in the UK, there is there are similar problems with mm -hmm. the estates. Um, there, some of them are landmarked, basically, which is what we see in in I think probably in other in Germany and other European countries, but certainly in in you know the um, in Italy, and and just not too much as much in America with the, what are left. But you'll see the the built more. Um, is it the built more the Baltimore the estate of the Vanderbilts in the South? Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, we we do see this, and so I'm glad you felt it could happen now because I wanted to make sure that you, the reader, would believe this would feel it um and then the town that if you recall there's a town in west virginia where the family fortune was made in mining and steel and like a lot of these towns in west virginia a mining country mm -hmm. for instance industrial in the post-industrial state what happened is many of the for a variety of reasons, the mines went dry, the steel plants closed, partly because of, you know, manufacturing outside of the United States, the movement of labor to foreign countries. Okay, so this, this family started this town, basically. Then the manufacturing began to decline. They sold it to the Japanese, the mills were closed, steel mills, 
and they left the town in ruins. If you've been in West Virginia, you've seen these towns. Mm -hmm. There's hardly anything there except these poor people who don't have jobs. Um, a lot of them turn to, to drugs or alcohol in despair. So the patriarch of, my, of the prince is very aware of what his family has done to this town. And like a lot of robber baron families, he wants to have a museum. In his case, he thinks it's going to bring tourists to the town and provide jobs. And it, that is also true of our robber baron families. Think of all the ones who started the Whitney's, the Vanderbilt's, the Rockefeller's, yeah. they all started these museums. And so that's in keeping. He's going to rebuild the old family house, which is built like a palazzo, an Italian, a Roman palazzo. So he, and he's going to, in another fascinating, at least I found it fascinating, in the turn of the century, the robber baron's wives, they would go to Italy, the men too, and bring back these old masters, which they bought from these impoverished families. And that was instead oh, wow. of postcards, which is how a lot of great art got to America in the first place. Then what also happened was after World War II, um, those families were were selling off their art because they were wrecked. You know, they were wrecked by the war, and, yeah. were, and so you saw a whole influx influx of great art, Renaissance, medieval art, at reasonably low prices right after World War II. So anyway, that is beside the point. The guy, the patriarch of the prince, wants to re revivify, to bring back to life this dead town that his ancestors ruined. So he's collecting art. And in the midst of this whole thing, the prince, he's trying to set up this museum. He, he gets his daughter married. She's, they're very, very close. He's, they lost her mother and his wife. He, so now he is forced to distance himself from his daughter. He's glad that she's happy, he thinks. But Christina, the old girlfriend, <laughs> comes from the scene. And, the daughter, beginning in the prince and in the real the golden bull, begins to realize something's going on. You're not sure how much she knows, but you, there's a sense of her husband's distant from her. Mm -hmm. He's not that interested in sleeping with her, and so she encourages her father to marry this girlfriend, perhaps to get the girlfriend out of the way, and. Then there's part of her that feels he's going to be lonely now that she's married. So now you have another sort of <laughs> catastrophe because the patriarch's wife is having an affair with his son-in-law. <laughs> and it just, and the daughter, the daughter's husband is having an affair with her stepmother. Yeah. So it's hard to sort through. So in the prince, you have a really bad situation that plays itself out in this private island that's very it's almost a primeval place you know it's untouched as as this family is in some way now untouched because of the huge wealth so how are they going to solve it i'm going to leave that up to <laughs> No, it's it's definitely because the different layers of all factor into the different relationships and secrets. It's it's interesting to like as a reader, like to kind of like what can you pick up as you read it, and and like are there like you know hints or whatever earlier in the book? Because like I'm I'm a reader that sometimes like as I'm reading it, like I'll go back to like double check something. Yeah. Um, so like I'll flip through pages and I'm like, did I, did I catch that? Like, am I making this up? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's fun to read, but I, I like this because it has appeal to people that are fans of Henry James would like this homage that you wrote. I like that it nope. <laughs> could be it, that um, it, to me, it's like a, a, a few different genres together. Cause you kind of have romance, you kind of have like, I almost like a soap opera type betrayal drama going on right um and I'm I I don't know about other readers but I hope they're similar to me is that like I'm so intrigued by some of the 
research or not so research of just your knowledge you have of like, yeah, this is what happened in the past and how you made it into modern times. It makes me want to like kind of dig into that like rabbit hole of research because I'm just like, oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. And I feel like a lot of people that like the historic period dramas that I like would like reading this because it's reminiscent of it, but it's modern. So you feel more relatable to it. Well, thank you. I, I hope you're right. I think um, number one, my as a, as a novelist, my primary goal is to tell a good story. Mm -hmm. I love that. I don't like it. There are a lot of sort of novels, contemporary novels that are written with paragraphs, disjunctive. Um, a lot of it is about, a lot of them written by women are about unhappy women and unhappy marriages, or they don't like their children, you know. <laughs> but I like to take my reader on a journey. And in The Prince, I tried to do that. I actually very much like the research of doing these novels. I like to build the, the scenes, build the, the imagery. Um, I like to, then I like to figure out what would they say to each other. But okay. I enjoy this research. Um, my husband is an historian and I've learned a lot about it, research from him. In fact, one of his books is about Andrew Carnegie, who was one of the great Gilded Age figures. Mm -hmm. And so I got some ideas from listening to him, reading his books about what happened in these towns, what these guys were like. Um, oh, wow. And in America, um, I've known families like this. You know, I'm not certainly not one of them, but I've watched as they grapple with with this legacy but it, interestingly the end of the novel which i'm not giving away <laughs> um is their solution is very real very real okay I think very unsurprising in the end but also in a way sort of terrible <laughs> and you'll have to you just have to Look at the book, and read it, read the prints, and you'll find <laughs> out uh, because it's sort of Machiavellian and Ooh. really weird, but I believed <laughs> it. I believed it. So, no, I, I like stories that like feel real and are believable. Like, I'm all, I, I read a variety of genres because I'll read like science fiction, fantasy, nonfiction, yeah, yeah. Uh, like just if it's a good book, it's a good book. Um, but I, I'm, I'm now really intrigued about the ending. So well, that's going to be you. my, my day today of like, okay, oh, is it lunch break time to, to finish the book to get to it? You, let me know what you think of the ending. I, oh, I, yeah. I, either call me or look, uh, send an email. <laughs> oh, no, I'm excited because I'll be like, oh, my God. But I, I really, what I find refreshing about it is how you talk about how they grapple with the legacy they do. I feel like a lot of stories are what people read in terms of these like great families it's more of like oh how do I live up to the legacy and maintain yes. my wealth it's not of how do I deal with the negativity that's associated with it and mm -hmm. I didn't know that this was something that kind of f some of them went through till reading this and I was just like oh wow like new perspective that's really like I didn't know any of this which I I enjoy finding out about life <laughs> well it is interesting to watch um, then um, actually uh, one of the Rockefellers we have a house upstate New York and one of them Abby who is the great granddaughter I think it is of John D has this enormous wealth right so she mm -hmm. has taken over a huge swath of land and built a sort of experimental farm um, in which the barns are circular because oh, wow. they're supposed to be better for the cows, the milk. And she sells cheese from this. She couldn't have bought this without huge wealth or built, especially built these circular barns and the gardens. But she's trying to do something good. She's, it's organic farming. Um, oh, cool. She's, she's actually famous for a certain kind of toilet that she was marketing, <laughs> which is kind of self-sustaining. I'm not sure how it works, but it oh, was wow. I'll have to look that up. <laughs> she 
did this, I do not know her personally, she did this for environmental purpose, you know, to deal with wastewater, the problem of wastewaters in cities. So this is what you, what happens when you're John Dee's great, great granddaughter, you know, what are you going to do with all this money? So, and what does it do to you? I mean, in my, in the Prince, the patriarch, his name is Henry. Everybody is trying to tell him what he wants to hear. You know, he's very smart. He's almost like, a, he presides over this kingdom, kind of like a god. He's <laughs> kind, he's a very kind man. Mm -hmm good-hearted man, mysterious, he's mysterious, and he, but he understands that people are being nice to him because they want some of his money or his prestige. Yeah. He's not stupid, and he's protective of this sweet daughter who is, has much less awareness of evil or of what's going on, and part of this novel, my, The Prince, is about her growing up or her uh, the acquisition of knowledge mm -hmm. being forced to see the reality of life um and that's she becomes she grows from a sort of innocent young woman in her 20s and into this wise very smart and possibly possibly but i'm not sure punish wrongdoing in her life the wrongdoers mm -hmm. but i'm not sure but again what you would what you would say you know okay. when you read well, it i'll i'll let you know when i finish it because <laughs> yeah. no, i i i like that because i i keep i feel like circling back to like it's refreshing to see especially henry's character because like a lot of times if i'm reading something of like I, maybe not like mega wealthy but like fairly well off it's like well i'm gonna either historical or modern times mm -hmm. of like oh well I'm gonna marry you off to like you need to marry this person we got to keep it like wealthy and this yeah. or they're just like very it's so kind-hearted that they're like naive and like lose all their money because they're they're such big-hearted people so mm -hmm. to see someone who's kind-hearted but has has the smarts and and knows kind of I'm just like oh that's refreshing to do and I think that her that Emily's like innocence is believable. Like some, I think some people might think it's a little disbelievable or mm -hmm. just suspend their belief of it of how could you be that innocent, especially in right. modern times. But I think you can be that sheltered, especially with that wealth. And if you have a father like him to like really be like, no, protect I gotta you. protect you from all this. Cause as great as the world is, there's also a ugly dark part of it that well, the other thing is in the novel, in the prince, there is a question, an issue. How much, what does she not want to know? Does she not want to know things? Mm -hmm. Why does she not want to know this about this affair? If that's the case, how much does she know she knows? You know, <laughs> uh, and that is a strategy that people sometimes employ in, in the midst of pain. Or, or terrible events they don't want to know but then eventually yeah. they're forced to know in the prince the girl emily i call her a girl she's actually she's in her late 20s she, you know we're not sure and she probably isn't sure what she know, wants to know about her husband having an affair with her mother with her yeah mother. and uh, so that's part of the problem um you know, I, I, I try to resolve it. It's interesting to try to write about something that the character, the main character in The Prince, the main characters, they know something, but as a novelist, you only want to portray them not knowing, not what they don't know. It's, it's a complex <laughs> thing because at the same time, you're telling the reader what's going on. Yeah. But now you have to portray someone not knowing what, it's right in front of their eyes or not wanting to know. So it's an interesting literary. I can imagine. <laughs> Cause it's like I, when I, I was watching a recap for something briefly, like actually last night where they're like, well, you as like, you know, like a reader or I, I don't remember if they were talking about like a book or a TV show, but like you as a viewer or a reader, you know, what's going on, you know, all the secrets, but some characters don't know what you know. Yeah. And it's kind of like when you're, 
reading or watching something and you know what the character does it and it's yeah. I the easiest way I could relate it is like in a horror story or horror yeah. movie of like don't go in the basement yeah. like, <laughs> where the you're kind of like talking to the reader like listen to me I know what's best for you I mean I but it's it's a fictional character do you but, know I this is off topic but it's fascinating <laughs> to me many of these horror stories you'll have the babysitter a young girl baby yeah. the parents are out and there's something bad in the basement there have been all these critiques of this genre. And it's like sort of started to happen when there was more sexual freedom for young women, you know, when birth control pills were more. Oh, wow. And everybody was very worried about how these young women would react. So they made these movies are an expression a lot, as are novels of cultural um, or of social events, social changes. And so, anyway, back to the prince, my novel. <laughs> there's something very lethal and dangerous happening to her. And it's in broad lit daylight, it's slow. It's because of course the marriage with the prince starts out very happy, beautiful wedding on the yeah. private island, the biggest private island in Long Island Sound. Again, you, you being on Long Island would be aware of Gardner's Island and mm -hmm. this beautiful island but that belongs to a, a one family, unless it's changed in the past couple of years. Um, it's maybe in a trust now, but it has for decades, centuries belonged to this one family. So uh, the danger is paradoxically played out in this idyllic, idyllic realm, not in the basement, but it's- yeah. A young woman confronted, confronted with her sexuality, her sexual love for her husband, mm -hmm. and that has its dangers. You know, she's being punished in a way for this marriage, but that's a, a, a rather broad analogy. But I think it it can be said. It's it's got a. She grows up in this, you know, bucolic primeval landscape, partly in the summer anyway. And here is something terrible happening there. Something really quite dangerous, emotionally dangerous. So that's the prince. <laughs> but I'm, I'm very excited to finish it. And listeners, readers, we do have the book at the library. It's on the shelves. I uh, is can. there, I tried looking it up, but I, I should have done a better job. Is there any thoughts of like doing an audio book of it? Um, I haven't heard yet. It's just published. Fact, yeah, it came out um, earlier this month. Right. I, I have to, I was actually meaning to find out what was happening. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful thing to listen to a story. It's the, that's the way it was when we were children. And I think- Oh, I love audiobooks. I, I'm more partial to audiobooks than I am physical books currently. I we're saying that. Yeah. Um, we, we do have it on Kindle and Nook. Um, but I, again, I'm going to have to find out about that. In fact, when I get oh. off, when I, when we finish, Sorry. I'm going to write a letter. <laughs> okay. And do you have any plans? Are you currently writing something? Are you allowed to talk about that? Or well, I can talk about it. Unfortunately, I'm not sure what I'm doing. I'm not writing. I'm, I'm spending a lot of time talking about the book for these events, which mm -hmm. I actually rather like doing very much. I love talking <laughs> about it now that it's done. Because as I talk about it, I figure out what I did, how I did it. I get to relive, live in this world again, which is a beautiful and elegant world. Mm -hmm. uh, but I haven't quite decided um, what I'm going to do next. I, I've been, you know, busy almost every day with several events. And um, I hope to, you know, when that sort of tapers off, I will begin to write. So. Oh. Well, I look forward to seeing what, what happens next. And because this is my first introduction to your writing of this book. Oh. So I'm now going to go to your previous books because now I'm like, ooh, I, yeah. I like finding new authors through our podcast, whether if I'm interviewing them or not. But I'm just like, oh, they have more than one book. Let's go back. Thank you very much. Oh, no, thank you for joining us. So we're going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. I am your host, Stacey, and signing off with our esteemed author guest. So tune in next time.
it's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.